If you don't win in space, if you cede space to your enemy, you are going to cede your future. Um, it used to be he who controls the seas controls the world. Now it's he who controls space controls the world. We want to make sure we don't cede it to China. So we're in a race to the moon. Starship Flight 11 was a spectacular display of engineering and ambition. But what does this successful mission mean for the future of the Starship program? Let's hear what SpaceX's president and other key industry voices have to say about this milestone. SpaceX pulled off another big win on Monday with the 11th launch of its super-heavy Starship rocket. And this one really built on the progress of past flights. Elon Musk, SpaceX founder and CEO, even popped onto the company's live stream for a quick cameo before liftoff. He mentioned it was actually the first time he planned to watch a Starship launch from outside. Don't have any mission control and stuff. Okay. Awesome. It's really going to be much more visceral. Yeah. yeah. Not long after, Starship, the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built, roared into the evening sky from the southern tip of Texas. The massive booster separated cleanly and made a controlled dive into the Gulf of Mexico, just as planned. Meanwhile, the Starship spacecraft soared up, skimmed the edge of space, then began its descent into the Indian Ocean. Nothing was recovered this time, but that wasn't really the point. On the achievement side, though, plenty. The vehicle deployed eight payloads during a six-minute window starting about 19 minutes after liftoff, while cruising 119 miles 192 kilometers above Earth. It also nailed a key technical milestone, a brief but successful Raptor engine relight nearly 38 minutes into the flight. As Starship headed back to Earth, it held up impressively through the extreme heat of re-entry, even with some heat shield tiles deliberately removed to test performance. The ship performed its complex banking maneuver before gently splashing down in the Indian Ocean just over an hour after launch. That move isn't just for show, it's actually practice for the kind of maneuvers Starship will need to pull off when it eventually starts flying back to its launch site. Perfecting that return is a major focus for the next phase of the Starship test campaign, which kicks off next year. The landing was right on target, captured live by a camera mounted on a buoy. Let him hear it, Starbase! SpaceX spokesperson Dan Hewitt shouted during the webcast, as cheers erupted from employees celebrating the flight's success. What a day. After the mission wrapped up, Musk chimed in again on X, writing, Great work by the SpaceX team. Someone else who was clearly thrilled about the flight? SpaceX president Gwyn Shotwell. She took to X after the launch, writing, I love Elon Musk and this incredible team. Co-SpaceX. She also shared a post from acting NASA administrator Sean Duffy, who praised the launch as another major step toward landing Americans on the moon's South Pole. The progress SpaceX demonstrated with today's Starship test is critical for our Artemis missions, Duffy said. While we prepare for Artemis II, every flight strengthens our progress on Artemis III and beating China back to the moon. While SpaceX is laser-focused on Mars, NASA's eyes are firmly on the moon. The Artemis III mission, aiming for a lunar landing in 2027, depends heavily on Starship's development. NASA has already poured more than $4 billion into customizing Starship to serve as a lunar lander, with one clear goal, get American astronauts to the moon before China does. The pressure is mounting. Recent Senate hearings and space advisory panels have raised concerns that delays could hand China a strategic advantage on the moon, despite existing international treaties. To hit NASA's tight timeline, SpaceX needs to do more than prove Starship can fly. They have to show it can be reused quickly and reliably. That means launching, landing, and refueling multiple Starships within just weeks, a massive technical and logistical challenge. Industry analysts say orbital refueling is the single most crucial milestone standing between today's test flights and tomorrow's deep space missions. Flight 11 took a big step toward that goal. One especially promising sign? There was no visible damage to the heat shield or flaps during re-entry, suggesting Starship might be able to fly again without major repairs. That's a game changer. To support Artemis, SpaceX will need to run multiple rapid refueling missions to power up the lunar version of Starship. And being able to reuse vehicles without refurbishing them is absolutely essential to making that happen. Let's be honest, as exciting as Flight 11 was, it only scratched the surface of what Starship needs to prove before it's ready for a moon mission. Even SpaceX acknowledged this in their post-launch update, saying the focus now shifts to the next generation of Starship and Super Heavy. 
Multiple new vehicles are already being built and prepped for testing, and this new iteration will take on major goals like operational payload missions, propellant transfer, and full orbital flights as SpaceX pushes toward a fully reusable launch system, one that can serve not just Earth orbit, but also reach the Moon, Mars, and beyond. SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell echoed that long-term vision at a space conference in Paris last month. She said the upgraded prototype they're working on is the one that could actually take humans to the Moon and Mars. That prototype is known as Starship Block 3, and it's expected to debut sometime next year, though there's a chance we might see it fly by the end of this year. The current Starship version, known as Version 2, is already massive, standing about 403 feet tall, or 123 meters, when stacked with the Super Heavy booster. It's an absolute powerhouse. A single Raptor engine generates about twice the thrust of all four engines on a Boeing 747. And the Super Heavy booster alone puts out a staggering 16.7 million pounds of thrust, which is roughly 74.3 mega newtons. But as big and powerful as it is, the future variants are set to go even further. Block 3 will stretch slightly taller to 408 feet, or 124.4 meters, and Musk has already hinted at a future version that could reach a towering 466 feet, that's 142 meters, making it taller than many skyscrapers. While the outside of the Starship upper stage will look familiar, Block 3 is a complete overhaul under the surface. It introduces the new Raptor 3 engines, which are simpler, more efficient, and significantly more powerful, delivering an estimated 280 metric tons of thrust each. These engines ditch the bulky heat shields, saving around 1.1 metric tons per engine, and feature a redesigned welded joint to improve strength while reducing weight. The goal here is to boost reliability, streamline manufacturing, and improve performance across the board. Bigger propellant tanks are also coming with this version, increasing payload capacity and reducing the number of refueling trips needed to top off a lunar-bound starship. In addition, there are major updates to the vehicle's energy systems and onboard avionics, allowing it to handle longer missions in space. One visible sign of these changes is the addition of a docking adapter on the outside of the vehicle. This will be used when two starships link up for in-orbit propellant transfer, a critical step in making lunar and deep space missions possible. Block 3 isn't just a technology testbed, it's the version of Starship SpaceX plans to use for the next big milestones. That includes orbital missions, catching the upper stage on its return to the launch site, performing in-orbit refueling, and eventually flying to the Moon and Mars. Super Heavy is also undergoing big changes. Some upgrades have already been spotted rolling out of the Star Factory, including a redesigned fuel transfer tube that's about the size of a Falcon 9 first stage. It channels cryogenic fuel down to all 33 engines, making for quicker, more reliable boost back burns and simultaneous engine relights. The booster's hot staging ring has been upgraded too, with more venting to manage the pressure from engine exhaust and an extra steel layer to protect against the intense heating during stage separation. Another big change comes to the grid fins. SpaceX is moving from four fins down to three, but each one is about 50% larger and much stronger. They're designed not only to guide the booster through descent, but also to align it precisely with the tower arms for catching. That's made possible by newly added catch points on the grid fins, which have also been repositioned on the booster to match up perfectly with the launch tower's arms during recovery. During the Flight 11 webcast, SpaceX shared some jaw-dropping footage of the Raptor 3 engine in action, including the vacuum version. Commentators confirmed that the first flight-ready engines are already in production and will soon be ready for testing, potentially in time for Flight 12. In the coming months, SpaceX is expected to give Pad 1 a major overhaul as it gets ready to serve as a second launch site for the upcoming Starship V3 flights. The upgrades will include a brand new orbital launch mount, an improved flame trench system to better handle the massive thrust, and updated chopsticks, the giant arms used to catch the booster to support future recovery attempts. All of this is happening at Starbase in Texas, but it's just part of a bigger expansion. SpaceX is also working to bring additional Starship launch pads online at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Until those Florida sites are ready, Pad 2 at Starbase is expected to come online soon and take over the bulk of launch operations for the next phase of testing.
But grand plans for future Starship aside, the next real step toward the moon is still Artemis II, NASA's upcoming crewed mission. At Johnson Space Center in Houston, NASA officials recently walked through what to expect when four astronauts head back toward the moon for the first time in over 50 years. The mission will carry NASA Commander Gregory Reed Wiseman, pilot Victor Glover, mission specialist Christina Cook, and Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen on a journey around the moon, marking the first time humans have visited the lunar neighborhood since 1972. According to Howard Hu, manager of NASA's Orion program, the Orion capsule will be the first spacecraft in half a century to carry humans to lunar orbit. NASA's Artemis launch director, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, confirmed that the Orion capsule and the massive SLS, Space Launch System, rocket, have already been stacked and are ready for action. Most of the heavy lifting by engineers and technicians is already done. She outlined a series of final tests that will take place before launch, including the crew suiting up and boarding Orion, followed by system checks and detailed checklists once they're inside. During this process, the rocket will be fully fueled in preparation for launch. Flight directors Judd Freeling and Jeff Radigan also shared what to expect on launch day and beyond. Once the towering 322-foot SLS Block 1 rocket lifts off from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39B, the crew will head for the moon, fly past it, orbit, and then return to Earth. Interestingly, Radigan explained that Artemis II will take the crew well beyond the moon, around 5,000 nautical miles, over 9,000 kilometers, past it. That's farther than any crewed mission has ever gone. From that distance, the moon will actually look a bit smaller than in previous missions, but the accomplishment will mark a major milestone in deep space exploration. After the trip around the moon, the crew will return to Earth and splash down in the Pacific Ocean, not far off the coast of San Diego. Artemis II was originally planned for November 2024, then pushed to September 2025. But due to a heat shield issue discovered during Artemis I, the timeline has been delayed further. That said, momentum is building, and when it launches, Artemis II will be a historic step in humanity's return to the moon.